So we're going to be doing the current affairs for today and some of the topics from yesterday, which is the usual thing. Uh, we can see some of the static syllabus over here, which is the Ashokan pillar. This is a static uh, concept. States can ease COVID curbs again. Uh, dynamic, but not so important. Organization of Islamic cooperation. This is a little bit of important topic because you can use it in your main answers. Apart from that, you have uh, this solar handling, uh, solar waste handling policy, which can be used in multiple concepts like e-waste, uh, solar energy drawbacks. You can use it in different different answers in the main context. Canadian truckers, not so important. However, this one, row between center and Telangana government over renewable energy procurement. This shall be important because renewable energy is a hot topic always. Uh, apart from this, uh, the one other topic which is very important is tribunal appointments being taken lightly by the, which has been said by the Supreme Court. Tribunals are a persistent question either in the prelims or in the mains. So these two are the most important ones. Okay. First idea, Ashokan pillar. The reason why it's in the news is because the Delhi police has changed its logo. Earlier it used to be represented by the Ashokan pillar, but now it is represented by the India gate. So what is the significance of the Ashokan pillar? You can see that the Ashokan emblem adorns the, it adorns the national symbol. Now, what you have to understand about the Ashokan pillar is that Uh, most of the Ashokan pillars are 40 feet high and the pillars were usually made of Shunar sandstone and comprised of four parts. What are the four parts? The four parts would be this would be the shaft. This is the lower part of the pillar. On top of this you either have a lotus block or you have a rectangular block or something. Uh, you either have a lotus shaped uh, or a bell shaped uh, capital, which is this. You can either have it on top of this, you tend to have either a rectangular or a square block. Now, This is known as the abacus. On top of the abacus, you have the animal. So these are the four parts. One, the shaft. Two, the capital. Three, the abacus. And four is the animal symbol. Now, uh, the bell-shaped capitals or the lotus-shaped uh, capitals were influenced by the Iranian pillars. The Iranian pillars are also known as Achaemenid pillars. As was the highly polished and the lustrous finish of the pillars. These pillars, they were extremely lustrous. So both this bell and the lustrous nature of the pillars were copied from the Achaemenid nature of pillars, the Iranian pillars. Now, what are the differences, however, that Ashokan pillars have with Achaemenid pillars? The shaft of the Ashokan pillars were monolithic. Remember, we saw that long pillar. So that is monolithic, which means that it is often made of a single stone. Whereas, when it comes to Achaemenian pillars, they were made up of multiple pieces of sandstone. Not one, multiple pieces. The Ashokan pillars were independently erected by royal diction, which means that these pillars need not be within the palace compound. Rather, they could be erected anywhere. That is the reason why we have so many Ashokan pillars all over the country. Whereas the Achaemenian pillars were generally attached to the state buildings. Only to the state buildings. Okay. Easy topic. Next one. States can ease COVID curbs according to center. Center has held that the states can uh, review, amend or end the additional COVID-19 restrictions as the cases are showing a declining trend. 
Now, in a letter to the states, the health ministry said that the daily case positivity on February 15th had declined to 3.63%. What is the daily case positivity rate? The daily case positivity rate is, if at all, the government is conducting 100 tests. How many tests amongst these 100 tests are positive? That is the daily case positivity rate. Now, so which means that out of 100 tests, currently only 3 tests are being positive. Uh, now, there is a lot of importance associ associated with this daily case positivity rate. It helps us determine the course of action that has to be taken. Now, if at all, the daily case positivity percentage is very high. It means that more testing should probably be done. And it suggests that it is not a good time to relax restrictions. However, since India has a very low case positivity rate at around 3.63%, it can be said that we are conducting enough tests and it can be said that our restrictions can be reduced a little like what the center has ordered the states to do. Now, see, if at all, there is a high percentage of positive of uh, the daily uh, case positivity rate. It means that out of 100 tests, there are around, uh, let's say the case positivity rate is around 25%. It means that a lot of people are actually infected. So we need to ideally increase our testing rather than decrease it to be able to find who is actually positive and how to curb it. The letters, the letter to the states held that states must continue monitoring the trajectory of cases and, and the spread of infection on a daily basis. They may also follow the broad five-fold strategy. You know the five-fold strategy, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, which is nothing but testing, tracking, treating, vaccination and adherence to COVID appropriate behavior. These are the five strategies that the government suggests to follow. Currently, there exist various views that the pandemic might soon become an endemic. Now, what is a pandemic? What is an endemic? There is a need to understand the differences between pandemic, endemic, epidemic. Now, it can be said that endemic is the initial stage. Epidemic more like endemic is a uh, threat, is a smaller threat. Epidemic is a bit of a bigger threat and pandemic is a biggest threat. This is a simple way to remember it, but we shall move into what these definitions actually mean. Now, when we talk about endemic diseases, endemic diseases are those diseases which are there in a particular territory only. A disease that occurs regularly in certain regions is known as endemic. It happens regularly. Like say for example, during monsoon season, you have a high proportion of malaria which happens in tropical regions. Okay. Uh, one second. Yeah. Malaria which annually affects around 300 million people worldwide with most of the diseases coming from tropics. It is a disease that happens very regularly. When a disease becomes endemic, the number of people falling ill remains relatively constant over time. Unlike in the case of Corona, there is no variation. Like we see in the case of Corona, in some months, uh, we call it as waves. So during that particular wave, the number of cases also rapidly increases and the number of uh, deaths also increase. So unlike that, in the case of endemic, it is a regular disease that keeps occurring and the number of people who are affected by this disease also remains relatively uh, the same. The number of cases is higher than in the other areas but does not increase over time. It remains normal, constant. Over a certain period of time, approximately the same number of people repeatedly contract the disease. We have given the example of malaria. Now, the World Health Organization predicted that the coronavirus could become an endemic virus. This is what the World Health Organization is saying. The Delta and the Omicron variants have since shown how adaptable the virus is. Much like flu. We know the common flu. We know that it is endemic in nature. It is regular in nature. It happens in a fixed region. It affects the same number of people. 
and doesn't mutate it does not increase the number of deaths and it does not increase the number of diseases rapidly now but in the case of an epidemic one second i'm sorry yeah now in the case of an epidemic this happens only in a single region okay again happens only in that particular region the spread of the disease is termed as an epidemic when it occurs with unusual frequency in a certain region and for a limited period of time now when the number of cases of a disease in that particular region rises above the expected endemic level now if at all a virus mutates and then it becomes very virulent or if at all a particular virus has been or a disease has been introduced newly in an area then it remains in that particular area but the number of uh, people who are affected by it increases drastically now that is the problem of an epidemic when the disease in incidence is localized it's often referred to as an outbreak so whenever the disease is localized only in that one particular area then we call it as an outbreak okay now an epidemic occurs for example when the virulence of a particular pathogen changes a virus mutates and becomes more contagious epidemics can also occur when diseases are newly introduced into a certain area now for example smallpox which was introduced to the americas via the arrival of europeans when the europeans went to south america or north america they carried along with them smallpox which became an epidemic over there because it was newly introduced over there and it was there in that particular region only and it started claiming a large number of deaths a large number of people became sick of it <laughs> while in the case of endemic it is pretty much the same numbers regularly and it keeps happening again and again and again whereas epidemic happens at one go large number of people there is no repetition it occurs because of uh, either virus mutation or because of newly introduction of uh, virus in non virus regions now as compared to this we have a pandemic if a disease spreads across countries and continents experts refer to it as a pandemic this means above all that successful control of the disease depends on cooperation amongst various countries only a pandemic is not restricted to a particular region it is rather spread over a large region over several countries hence we need cooperation between various countries this way it differs from endemic and epidemic according to the who and the us uh, center for disease control and prevention pandemics are usually caused by newly emerging pathogens or virus types for example these can be zoonoses what are zoonoses zoonotic diseases are those that are capable of jumping these are viruses that can jump from animals to humans like say for example the corona virus if a disease is new to humans very few people will be immune to the virus vaccinations are also not available in this case this can lead to vast number of people becoming infected typical example is corona virus now lack of immunity lack of vaccinations hence high number of deaths casualty is high but it need not also happen the number of deaths need not also be very high say for example zika the deaths were uh, extremely uh, small as compared to uh, corona uh, next organization of islamic cooperation now why is it in the news the reason why it is in the news is because india has condemned the motivated and misleading statement made by the organization of islamic cooperation which expressed deep concerns over what it called continued attacks on muslims in india and called upon international community to take necessary measures this organization of islamic cooperation has said that there have been uh, there has been discrimination against muslims in the country and uh, this is a problem according to them now uh 
earlier the oic had asked india to oh, sorry what is the issue actually why is the oic making these statements uh, why did it exp uh, express deep concerns regarding the state of muslims in india the oic had expressed deep concerns over recent public calls for genocide of muslims by hindutva proponents in haridwar and reported incidents of harassment of muslim women on social media sites as well as banning of muslim girls students from wearing hijab in the state of karnataka I'm sure you have heard of the haridwar conference one one more thing was we had apps which had profiles of muslim women and they were targeting them there were students behind uh, the apps and they have been apprehended and also the recent controversy of banning of uh, religious symbols in educational institutions we discussed this some days back please go through it so these three incidents uh because of these three incidents uh, the oic has asked for uh, i mean has uh, expressed deep uh, concern earlier the oic had asked india to reverse its decision of scrapping article 370 also which gave special status to the erstwhile state of jammu and kashmir during the sidelines of the 76th un general assembly general assembly uh this is a one time thing that happens every year like the 75th general assembly 76th general assembly so during the 76th general assembly oic has observer status in the un uh, general assembly and hence it uh, said that it uh, asked india to reverse its decision of abrogating the special status of jammu and kashmir now what is the oic oic is an international organization founded in 1969 consisting of 57 member states it comprises of majorly muslim dominated states countries and uh, it is actually a very large organization it can be understood from the fact that it has 57 member states it's the second largest intergovernmental organization after the united nations the organization states that it is the collective voice of the muslim world and works to safeguard their rights okay the oic has permanent delegations to the united nations and the european union please remember where the permanent secretariat is it is in jeddah now also along with this please read about the gulf cooperation council gulf cooperation council and where its headquarters are also if you have the time you can read about the arab league it is not in the news these days but do read it if you get the time and the opec these are organizations which are related to uh, the middle east okay next one of the most important topics for today tribunal appointments being taken lightly according to the supreme court now why is the supreme court so annoyed the supreme court on wednesday said that a judicial intervention saw the government take abrupt efforts to fill in the vacancies in tribunals some time back and nothing after that suddenly the government started taking interest in filling up the tribunals but soon uh, this was forgotten and now again the tribunal uh, appointments have taken a back seat the court held that the government only took knee jerk steps to fill in vacancies and not real steps in september last year a special bench led by the cji accused the center of cherry picking names for appointments to tribunals which were left almost defunct by long pending vacancies now how does appointment to tribunals happen so we have a search and selection committee which is headed by a sitting judge of the supreme court now the judge is often nominated by the chief justice of india after the search and selection committee picks the names the center we have the appointments uh, i am sure you heard about the cabinet committees so within the cabinet committees we have the appointments committee so the center uh, through the appointments committee appoints these particular members who been selected by the uh, search committee now the bench had then 
earlier in september the bench had held its hand on initiating contempt proceedings against the government and rather gave the government two weeks to make appointments to all the tribunals otherwise the court could have ordered uh, contempt proceedings for not filling up the vacancies now about the tribunals the original constitution did not contain provisions related to tribunals so the tribunals were not present in the original constitution rather they became a part of the constitution later on the 42nd amendment act of 1976 added a new part 14a to the constitution this part is known as tribunals and consists of two articles 323a and 323b okay you have 323a 323 b these two are under part 14 a of the constitution this was done in the 42nd amendment act they were not there before that now why were the tribunals set up they were set up to reduce the workload of the courts and to expedite decisions and to provide a forum which would be manned by lawyers and experts see most of the reasons why we have tribunals is because there is a lot of workload on the courts and also courts sufficient they do not have sufficient expertise like say for example uh, in the matters of environment courts will hardly have uh, the high courts or the supreme court will hardly have the kind of expertise that a particular uh, expert who's researching or who's been working in the government for the last uh, 10 years would have and hence to provide that particular expertise tribunals were launched however tribunals have several problems one of it is what we saw just now often tribunals have vacancies they have a lot of vacancies even when the supreme court pushes for vacancies to be filled up the government does not fill in so ultimately ideally uh, these subjects have to be taken up only by the tribunals and not by the high court so if the tribunals are not filled up people don't have an alternative they have to wait until they get their turn in these tribunals and when tribunals are not filled up there is a case load and it will take years and years for that case to be heard also apart from that tribunals are often controlled by their parent ministry like say for example ngt ngt comes under the uh, provisions of its parent ministry the environmental ministry it depends on them for funding it depends on them for uh, any sort of measures autonomy etc also uh the other major important concern is that there is a lot of interdepartmental uh litigation so most of the tribunals are actually filled by departments fighting against department like say for example urban ministry it has a problem with the environmental ministry so these tribunals are clogged with these interdepartmental cases okay now um next tribunals classification of tribunals we, uh, we said that we have two types of uh, articles under tribunal section one is 323a this is responsible for administrative tribunals while 323 b this is responsible for other tribunals okay now within 323 a we have central administrative tribunal and we have state administrative tribunals now central administrative tribunal exercises original jurisdiction in relation to recruitment and all service matters of public servants hence whenever there is an issue if at all uh, once you join the all india services the first tribunal that you will be going to file your case would be the central administrative tribunal now its jurisdiction extends to all india services the central civil services the civil posts under the center and civilian employees of the defense services however the members of the defense forces officers of the supreme court 
people working in the parliament they cannot file cases under the cat the central administrative tribunal next now the members who are uh, judges over oh, here they are drawn from both judicial as well as administrative streams and they are appointed by the president they hold office for a term of 5 years or until they attain the age of 65 whichever is earlier in the case of chairman and 62 years in the case of members the appointment of members is made on the basis of recommendations like what i said of the selection committee now the most important thing is that the cat is not bound by the procedure laid down by the civil procedure code but rather it is guided by principles of natural justice now the importance of this is that there is flexibility when uh, these tribunals are guided by either the civil procedure code or the criminal procedure code it is extremely rigid so this uh, principles of natural justice ensure that there is flexibility and the appellant can either appear in person or through a lawyer similarly the state administrative tribunals also are there like what i said now they also are there for only people who are appointed to the public services under the state now chairman and the members of the sat are appointed by the president after consultation with the governor of the state concerned most important there also exist tribunals for other matters under 323b however under 323b it's not only the parliament 323a only the parliament can fix these uh, tribunals while under 323b the parliament and the state legislatures are authorized to provide for the establishment of tribunals for the adjudication of disputes related to say taxation foreign exchange industry labor land reforms etc why because land is a subject under state so often it would be the states who have to fix a tribunal for that now articles 323a and 323b they differ in the following three aspects now 323a contemplates establishment of tribunals for public service matters only while 323b like what we said it can be for any of these matters and more while tribunals under 323a can be established only by the parliament 323b can be established by both the state government also and the parliament depending upon the matters falling within their legislative competence and hence land related tribunals have to be formed by only the state government under article 323a only one tribunal for the center and one each for the state or two or more states may be established there is no question of hierarchy of tribunals whereas under 323b a hierarchy of tribunals may be created so under 323a state administrative tribunals are separate and the central administrative tribunals are separate whereas in the case of uh, 323b there exists no concept of hierarchy and uh, they are always uh, separate india lacks solar waste handling policy okay now first of all please understand that in the case of india we are trying to increase our solar energy capacity currently we have targets of achieving 100 gigawatts of solar energy by 2022 of the 60 gigawatts of energy has to come from stand alone solar uh, projects while 40 gigawatts has to come from rooftop solar projects oh. 100 gigawatts by 2022 60 gigawatts stand alone and uh, 40 gigawatts are rooftop okay while india ramps up its solar power capacity the nation does not yet have a firm policy on managing waste that results from used solar panels or from manufacturing process now the irena the international renewable energy agency now where is its headquarters again this is one of those things which has its headquarters in the middle east please find where 
estimated that the global photovoltaic waste will touch 78 million tons by 2050 with India expected to be one of the top five generators of such photovoltaic waste. India currently considers solar waste as a part of its e-waste and hence there exists no separate policy for handling of solar waste. Currently in India, the cumulative capacity of grid-connected solar photovoltaic installations is around 40 gigawatts. We have 40 gigawatts of solar energy generation capacity currently. And uh, of which about 35.6 gigawatts is generated from ground mounted plants and 4.4 gigawatts from rooftop solar. Next. Now this is only, uh, this is only, this 40 gigawatts is, it only talks about the amount of solar energy that is going into power generation. We have other solar energy also. So this 40 gigawatts is only out of power generation capacity. Solar waste. Solar panels have an estimated lifespan of about 25 years. So after this 25 years, they turn to be waste. And hence we need to dispose them and recycle them properly. However, in the case of India, we started our solar revolution only around 2010. So we still have not seen the amount of waste that we would see in the future. Now, a large amount of waste will get generated in due course of time. Apart from this, modules could also develop defects during the plant operations and be discarded even before the scheduled lifespan. So even before these 25 years, say for example, if the photovoltaics develop any problems, so they can be discarded and thus there will be a lot of waste that will be generated. Now, Canadian truckers and border protest. Now, uh, I'll tell you what the background of this issue is. Uh, so Canadian truckers, I'm sure you know that Canada and USA have some of the highest trade that happens across borders. So recently Canada and USA, they came up with a policy that truckers will be spared of their quarantining, 14 day quarantining only if they are fully vaccinated. Now, truckers took an exception to this and they said that they will lay a siege to border crossings and thus they will prevent border trade from happening. So a Canadian official said that truckers protesting the country's COVID-19 restrictions are dismantling their last remaining blockade along the US border. Meanwhile, the siege of Ottawa appears to be increasing. So truckers are now moving from borders to Ottawa. Ottawa is the capital of Canada. Now, in 2019, demonstrators drove a convoy of hundreds of trucks from Western Canada to Ottawa in opposition to the government's new carbon tax. So the government imposed a new carbon tax in order to reduce the dependency on fossil fuels. The same thing was done even in France, where it led to a yellow vest movement. This was similarly opposed even by the truckers and a lot of people. So this, this particular discontent, it has been there since a long time. Since 2019. Okay. Now, the Freedom Convoy. This is known as the Freedom Convoy because they need freedom for vaccine choice, it seems. Now, the Freedom Convoy organizers said that they were protesting a federal government requirement that truck drivers be fully vaccinated if they want to avoid a 14 day quarantine upon re entry from the United States. Now, these people are camping now in Ottawa and Ontario and they are demanding an end to COVID-19 vaccine mandates, compulsory vaccination and mask requirements. Now, however, one thing that we need to know is that even if Canada abolishes this quarantining, USA still has its quarantining uh, demand, which means that people who are going across the border will have to quarantine in USA. So it doesn't matter if Canada removes or has it in place. That is what the demonstrators need to realize. Row between center and Telangana government over renewable energy procurement. Now, the union power minister dismissed statements by the Telangana chief minister that the center was pushing states to buy solar power from certain developers. Okay. Now, we need to understand that when it comes to 
सोलर India has actually launched the International Solar Alliance. At the uh, 2015 COP conference in Paris. Now, some of the programs of this International Solar Alliance are for uh, it wants to push for economies of scale. They want to invest a lot of money into procurement of solar photovoltaics, into uh, research and development of new and better technologies. So that is what the International Solar Alliance is there for. Uh, one of their other programs, which was recently announced by the Prime Minister during the Glasgow conference was also warm. One sun, one world, one grid. Which means that since the sun does not sit anywhere on the planet and it keeps moving from one area to another, it says that solar energy can also be sufficiently generated. As to wherever the sun is shining, there solar energy will be generated. And this will be sent or shared across borders. And hence, there will be one grid across the entire world. That is the concept of Osawag. Some of the other commitments that India made at the uh, COP uh, in Glasgow were that India will ensure that around 50% of its energy usage, 50% of its power necessity will come from renewable energy. Uh, and then apart from that, uh, India had uh, promised that we will generate about 500 gigawatts of renewable energy. And uh, also we will reduce our emission intensity by 45% as compared to the 2005 levels by 2030. There were several commitments made by India and uh, please read about them. So India has been making a massive push towards renewable energy. It is one of the leaders of renewable energy. So we should all be proud about that. Now, now the states have certain concerns. States like Telangana have been vocal about increasing burden forced upon states by the center on account of the clean energy cess. Now the clean energy cess is something that is imposed on fossil fuel usage, especially coal usage. So, uh, even uh, production of, uh, say, crude oil, all of them, they have a particular cess known as the clean energy cess. Now, this has been increased from rupees 50 to rupees 400 per ton on coal in 2017. Under renewable purchase obligations, power distribution companies known as discoms purchase a certain percentage of the requirements from renewable energy sources this is given under the indian electricity act please remember this this is given under the indian electricity act now renewable purchase obligations set targets for states for both solar and non solar energy procurement as part of their renewable purchase obligations so this particular renewable purchase obligations it is mandatory for the discoms to purchase sufficient a certain amount of renewable power as a total percentage of their total power okay now this renewable purchase obligations it also has targets of solar targets and non solar targets now Renewable energy. Apart from these renewable purchase obligations, if at all state is not able to buy, purchase enough renewable energy, it does not want to buy renewable energy. They can also go for purchase of renewable energy certificates. These certificates are actually given to renewable energy producers for producing so much of renewable energy. So these certificates are often traded on exchanges like how we have NSE and BSC, there are also exchanges where these renewable energy certificates are sold. India Energy Exchange is one of them. Over there, people sell their renewable energy certificates, and states and those uh, discoms which need to meet their renewable purchase obligations can buy renewable energy certificates. Okay, next. 
the proportion of renewable energy for utilities is fixed by the central and the state electricity regulatory commission oh sorry okay uh, one of the most important things is these so the it is the central electricity regulatory commission which determines what is the percentage of renewable purchase obligations uh, what is the percentage of renewable energy uh, that has to be procured as a total percentage of their electricity requirements and based upon the recommendations of the cerc the central electricity regulatory commission the states set their targets okay now the cerc and the scrc were also set up as statutory bodies under the electricity act of 2003 now some of the other functions of the cerc scrcs are that they are responsible for any uh, any cases which come related to electricity or when it comes to fixing of tariffs we have electricity per unit cost of electricity is there so cerc and scrc are the bodies which set the tariffs for electricity usage now uh, and then if you have any complaints against discoms they settle cases so if at all uh, people are not happy with the verdict of cerc and scrc there exists an appellate body known as appellate a p t e l appellate body for electricity so you can go and appeal it in the appellate body for electricity uh, please do remember that most of these statutory bodies will also have appellate bodies that you can appeal to uh, for example in the case of competition commission of india its appellate body is nclat national okay so you know the competition commission of india if at all once you appeal in the competition commission of india you are not happy with the verdict so you can appeal it in the uh, nclat national company law appellate tribunal from here if you want to appeal again you can go to the supreme court so please do read about the various statutory bodies and their appellate bodies that exist it will help you in your prelims definitely thank you